Jen friends, I'm Major Gauravari and you're watching the Chanakya Dialogues English. Mark my words, look after three, four months what happens. And today I'm predicting, Iran is already isolated, it will be further isolated because Iran is going to end up with the egg on its face. Because now in France, they killed an old lady going to church. They just killed her. Why? Because she was available. That was the target that was available. Somebody took a knife, stabbed her in the neck. Allahu Akbar. End of story. Jen friends, I'm Major Gauravari and you're watching the Chanakya Dialogues English. Like this video, subscribe to our channel and don't forget to press the bell icon. Now, there is news from Iran and how Iran is getting together the entire Muslim Ummah, the Muslim world and telling them that you need to take direct action against Iran and this is not just limited to diplomatic action. Today, uh, in part, this is not the whole video, but in part and a substantial part, we are going to discuss how Iran is playing its role in the larger context of the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Now, first of all, so the Iranian foreign minister, his name is Hossein Amir Abdullahin. Hossein Amir Abdullahin says that A, there should be sanctions by the Muslim countries on Israel. Now, when you say sanctions, you're talking about largely economic sanctions. So he is calling for, and this is state policy of Iran, he is calling for uh, the economic boycott of Israel. Now, the Muslim countries don't have any technology, right? And if you want to boycott Israel or if you want to boycott the Jews, then may as well start with Facebook and may as well start with so many other things like why go to Starbucks? If you check out all these businesses, many of them have been started by Jews. Many of them are owned by Jews. So I think this is a little bit of hypocrisy on Iran's part. We'll discuss that further now. So an embargo on, on uh, Israel. So what is an embargo actually? An embargo is a physical embargo when no goods move out or move in from Israel. So there should be an embargo on Israel. This is what Iran is saying. Does the Muslim world have the capacity uh, to actually say that there'll be an embargo in Israel? Absolutely not. They have no capacity. They have zero capacity to do this. But talk is cheap, action is expensive, and Iran is indulging in talk, right? Now, another thing that Iran is saying is that diplomatic boycott of Israel by Muslim countries. So they're saying that pull out your ambassadors from there, pull out your embassies from there, throw out Israel's embassies. So uh, th there is, there is uh, you know, blockading of Israel, they're talking about, you know, diplomatically isolating Israel. And very importantly, what they're saying is that Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, expressed strong sentiments emphasizing that the Muslims worldwide and resistance forces would be unstoppable if Israel's actions in Gaza persisted. So he's saying that get together Muslims of the world and attack Israel. Now, this is a madman speaking, right? And Muslim countries have tried in the past and they've tried multiple times. And every single time, you know, whether you look at the actions in the late 40s, the very late 40s, uh, throughout the 50s, 67 war, if you look at the actions uh, in the 73 war, and even later on in the 2000s, every time somebody has attacked Israel, Israel has beaten them black and blue. Israel has given them a thrashing of a lifetime and not only has Israel given them a thrashing? Israel has humiliated them on the battlefield. It seems that the humiliation is not enough and it seems that these countries want still more humiliation at the hands of Israel. Now, he is obviously calling Muslim countries to arms and he's saying attack, which is why I have always supported Israel. For a very long time, Israel has been telling the world that this is the right time to strike at Iran. Strike at Iran. You know, don't let them get nuclear weapons because what is Iran's stated policy? Iran's stated policy is that, uh, you know, Israel is the great shaitan, it's, it's the Satan and it must cease to exist. That is what these mad mullahs of Iran, you know, that is what they say. And this is what they want to do. So here is what, so they're talking about diplomatic isolation. They're talking about physical economic blockade, which the Muslim countries can't do. Diplomatically, they don't carry much clout except for UAE and except for Saudi Arabia. Uh, maybe to a little bit Indonesia and, and uh, a little bit Malaysia, but Muslim countries as such have very little diplomatic clout, very little. And what they do have is because of oil. Apart from that, no great inventions, no great technology. 
apart from, I think oil is the biggest thing that these 57 Muslim countries, not all of them, a few of them, have given to the world. Apart from them, uh, there's, apart from oil, I mean, there is very little else. So, do they have the capacity to isolate Israel? No. The entire Western civilization stands with Israel. Everybody stands with Israel. And I'll tell you what, the truth is, many Muslim countries who are now neutral and who are condemning this entire conflict also stand with Israel. That is what is happening. And Iran is going to be isolated. I'm telling you today, mark my words, look after three, four months what happens. And today I'm predicting, Iran is already isolated. It will be further isolated because Iran is going to end up with the egg on its face. Iran has no credibility and all Iran does is spread terrorism. You see, uh, it's a terrorist regime and uh, it will be sorted out sooner than later. I am absolutely sure of this. Now, Joe Biden says that uh, <clears throat> he told Netanyahu that the hospital strike on Gaza seems to have been done by the other team. He said, sad and outraged by an explosion at the Gaza Strip. Based on what I have seen, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not you. Right? And Hamas is worse than Islamic State for its killing of Israeli civilians. Biden said that Hamas's terrorism makes ISIS look more rational. This is the President of the United States and this is American policy. I have said it before, I'll say it again. Two nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, General Ford and another one, both 100,000 tons dis displacement, you know, with nuclear missiles on board, with more than 90 aircraft on board, with thousands upon thousands of service personnel and this entire fleet ecosystem, two of them are standing outside Israel and they belong to the United States of America and also UK has put its navy there somewhere close by. The US is sending tons of weapons and ammunition to Israel. So if, if Iran thinks that it can play a funny trick, the maximum Iran can do, and this is my prediction which I'm willing to make here, uh, the maximum Iran can do is send a few more terrorists. That's it. Iran cannot do anything about, uh, uh, apart from saying, okay, we'll give some money to Hezbollah and maybe we'll send, uh, you know, Hezbollah will send three, four suicide bombers. That's it. Iran has no capacity. And I'll tell you why this problem of capacity in many of these Muslim countries. They are not democracies. Who do they talk for? Who do they stand with? The people are not behind them. And that is why even in Muslim countries, you know, in the majority of Muslim countries, they do not want to encourage people coming on the streets and talking about Palestine. They don't want to encourage uh, people protesting, even for Palestine, even for Palestine, even against Israel, they don't want to encourage, uh, you know, stuff here. Why? Because they know that if they allow a protest for Palestine, this idea of a protest will get into people's minds and tomorrow they'll say we want democracy. They, you know, it, it's, it's a protest. If they get used to protesting, there are so many things in Muslim countries worth protesting. They'll say, we don't have freedom of speech. They'll say, we want, we want a free media. We want this and we want that. So the best thing is scare people, scare the Muslim world that the Jews are coming after you, the Christians are coming after you, the Hindus are coming after you, everybody's coming after you. Keep them in a perpetual state of absolute terror and fear that, you know, people outside are coming to kill you. That's number one. Number two, religion. In every aspect of life, keep injecting religion because there is no opium like religion. Any other, I, I'm talking about all religions. I'm not talking about Islam specifically. Any religion, too much of it in every sphere of life becomes like opium. You get used to it, it gives you a kick. And this is exactly what many of the Muslim countries have done. They have injected religion into every single phase of life. And they are unable to look beyond religion. I'm not talking about all Muslim countries. Now, the UAE is a modern state, right? It may not be a Western democracy, but people in UAE are happy. And what matters is that the people should be happy. People in Saudi Arabia are happy. But what about basket cases like Yemen? And what about basket cases like Syria and Lebanon and Palestine? And Egypt is such a lovely country. I don't know, politically they've gone to the dogs, but it's such a beautiful country. Egypt has such lovely people, you know, great history. They just spoiled it. They just spoiled everything, yeah, unfortunately. So, uh, <clears throat> this is what is happening as far as the Iranians are concerned. And then, you know, there are other, I, I have other news here. And uh, Jordan and Egypt have refused to take Palestinian refugees. 
I don't know why. What about Muslims of the world come together and defeat? What happened to that? So talk is cheap. That is exactly what the Pakistanis do, ladies and gentlemen. They talk. Throughout the day, Pakistanis do nothing but talk. Talk, 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 talk. That's all. That is the Pakistani obsession. They'll just keep on talking and this is exactly what Egypt is doing. This is exactly what Jordan is doing. They're just talking. They want to endlessly talk and they're not with. So everybody say, do you stand for Palestine? Of course we stand for Palestine. We'll die for Palestine. There are Muslim brothers, blah, blah, blah. But not one Palestinian will enter Egyptian soil. End of story. And I'll tell you, tomorrow it could happen that they reverse their decision. It could happen. But they're going to keep them segregated in camps with armed guards stationed outside. And I'll tell you why. I'm going to tell you a bitter truth with, with uh, you know, which, which, which many people may not like. They may not agree with. But the fact of the matter is that nobody trusts the Palestinians. In the Islamic world, in the Muslim world, nobody trusts the Palestinians. They are troublemakers. They have done so much against Jordan. Jordan was foolish enough to give them refuge after 1967 war. They betrayed the king of Jordan. They betrayed his trust. They created absolute fitna, absolute chaos inside Jordan. They tried to uh, topple the Jordanian king. They tried to actually enforce a military coup. They tried all of that. So the world, the Muslim world especially, does not trust Palestinians. They'll support them on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. They'll do all of that. But when push comes to shove, hey, <clears throat> do you want to do something for the Palestinians? I'm sorry, no. They're not welcome. This is exactly what he said. Now I'm going to read out the statements. Uh, <clears throat> first, King Abdullah too. King Abdullah is uh, in, in Berlin. When, he, when he, he was traveling to Berlin and in Berlin, he spoke to reporters and he said, this is a red line, no refugees to Jordan and also no refugees to Egypt. So King Abdullah II speaks not only for Jordan, he has spoken for Egypt and he's saying, this is the red line. We will not accept it. I mean, you want our help on Twitter, you want me to tweet and retweet and you want to say that, okay, make a video and say that, oh, Palestinians are suffering and we are with you and the Muslims of the world are with you. Great. We'll make videos for you. We'll give interviews and all that. We'll condemn Israel. But we don't want one single Palestinian on our soil. This is the king of Jordan. King Abdullah II. This is a red line. He says, I repeat, no refugees to Jordan and also no refugees to Egypt. This is a situation that is to be handled within Gaza and the West Bank. And you don't have to carry this out on the shoulder of others. So they're saying essentially, don't use our shoulders. It's your problem. You live with it. You want a tweet? You know, Israel is a bad country and the Palestinians are the best people in the world. You want a tweet? I'm happy to tweet. Uh, you want an Instagram story? I'm happy to give you an Instagram story. You want an interview on this? Sure. But the red line is, Palestinians will not enter Jordan. End of story. Now, Egypt's president has gone one step further. And this guy is wonderful. What a scam here. Look at this. Egypt's president, his name is President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Now, both these are Muslim countries, by the way. Uh, Jordan is an Islamic country. Egypt is an Islamic country, all right? President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, he says the displacement of Palestinians from Gaza to Egypt means the same displacement will take place for Palestinians from West Bank into Jordan. Subsequently, the Palestinian state that we are talking about and the world is talking about will become impossible to implement because the land is there, but people are not. Therefore, I warn of the danger of this matter. Simple. End of story. There is nothing else to discuss. I mean, President al-Sisi has made it very plain. He is saying that, you know, if you leave Palestine and the people are not there, only the land remains, how can you have a Palestinian state without people? Simple, isn't it? Basically, I'll tell you what. Uh, it's not like the entire population is leaving. But there will be approximately a million, million and a half people who will leave. Their issue is different. When Palestinians go from Palestine to some other country, they don't come back. They might travel to Palestine, they will never come back. Do you want 500,000, maybe half a million radicalized people inside your country? Nobody wants it. They are happy to fuel radicalization at a distance. So look at Iran, for example. Iran is happy to fuel Hezbollah, which kills Israelis. It is happy to pay for 
when I say fuel Hezbollah, uh, in the sense of giving them money, giving them that black oil money, giving them weapons, giving them training, giving them that financial uh, infrastructure, everything. So Iran actually fuels Hezbollah. It created Hezbollah, right? And it fuels Hezbollah. It fuels the Hamas. It powers the Hamas, right? So it is okay for Hamas and Hezbollah to enter Israel and kill Jews. That is okay. But it's not okay for a 16-year-old girl in Tehran to walk out of her house not wearing a hijab. That is worthy of death. Irani mindset. Right? Thousands of people can get killed. That's all right. But one woman not wearing the hijab, oh, the skies have fallen. So this is what is happening there. And both Jordan and Egypt have said, no, we don't want any Palestinian refugees. Thank you very much. This is the red line. Stay in your country. Yeah, we'll tweet about you. Have a good day. All right. You know, a Berlin synagogue, synagogue is, is like a mandir for, for Hindus and a mosque for Christians and a uh, mosque for Muslims and a church for Christians. Synagogue is for Jews and it was firebombed. So what happened was that uh, Molotov cocktails, you know, Molotov cocktail, I'll, I don't want to get into how to, it's very simple actually. You take a bottle, you put some fuel inside and you put a wick and you put some uh, thicker oil in it, something like grease or something like that and then, you know, or um, engine oil and then largely petrol and then you throw it and it, it sticks and it burns. It's, it's a weapon, Molotov cocktail. So Molotov cocktail, it was thrown at a synagogue and uh, Chancellor, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz later strongly condemned the attack saying we will never accept when attacks are carried out against Jewish institutions. He denounced the attack, stating that countries stand united for protection of Jews. Despite signs of increasing anti-Semitism, the Chancellor also worked to fight against anti-Semitism on German soil. See, I'll tell you what. It is not just anti-Semitism that you're fighting with, right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, it's not about Jews here. I think we're mistaken here. Now, what happened in Sweden? What happened in Sweden? And it happened day before yesterday. We covered it in the Janakya Dialogues, English and Hindi both. One guy, he says that, I am inspired by the Islamic State. So he takes a knife. This is a lone wolf attack. He takes a knife and there are a couple of, I think, football fans or soccer fans or whatever. He stabs three random people and they die. And then he makes a video. This character, he makes a video saying that I have done it for the glory of Allah. I am a soldier of the Islamic State, he says. And then he goes on to say that, you know, I have avenged. Islam, you know, things that people have done against Islam. Now, what is the fault of these three citizens? They were just enjoying a sports match or a sports game. They were just enjoying that. And they were killed. Why were they killed? Again, if you ask why, people say, oh, you're a communal... No, I want to know why. Because I'm sure the people who killed them had a reason. And I will tell you why. Because they were Christians. They were killed because they were Christians. Here a synagogue is being firebombed because it is a house of worship of Jews. It is not just about anti-Semitism. It is also about anti-Christianity. Anybody for these people, and I'm not, I'm not painting the entire Muslim community with the same brush because that will be absolutely unethical and wrong. And also logically, it's illogical actually. Because in every community, every religion, all people are not like that. Whether it's Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs or Christians, there are different people everywhere. But I am talking about these people who say, oh, we owe fealty to the Islamic State or Hamas, etc. Why are they killing these people? So when the German, German Chancellor, you know, Scholz, he says that, you know, we must protect the Jews. Sir, you must also protect the Christians. Because everyone for these clowns of the Islamic State, Daesh, all right? For the people of Daesh, for the people of Al-Qaeda, for the people of Hamas, Anybody who is non-Muslim is a legitimate target. It does not matter if it's a two-year-old kid. It does not matter if, if it's a housewife or, you know, some old lady going to church. It does not. In France, they killed an old lady going to church. They just killed her. Why? Because she was available. That was the target that was available. Somebody took a knife, stabbed her in the neck. Allahu Akbar. End of story. You have to understand the context. You see? And then... A large majority of Muslims are demonized because you start demonizing a people because then there is fear. Right? When two, three incidents like this take place, then people start talking. And this is exactly what Islamic State wants. Marginalization of Muslims in Europe 
and in America by doing such things and once they are marginalized, then you recruit from within. Because then you say that, okay, you, people don't like you. They suspect you, etc. You, you're such a good guy. You run a 7-Eleven, but they're still troubling you. Why? You understand? Tearing the social fabric of a nation, that is what these people are trying. And that is why they attacked the synagogue. Okay, Mohammed Saleh, famous Liverpool striker, one of the highest profile Muslim footballers in the world, made the donation to the Egyptian Red Crescent on Sunday. The amount was undisclosed, but is said to be significant. Salah had faced criticism in Egypt for not using his profile to comment on the Israel-Hamas war. But in social media on Wednesday, he called the world leaders to prevent further slaughter of innocent soul. I think this is all nonsense. <clears throat> I think it's absolutely idiotic on part of Mohammed Saleh to say that, you know, you want to give money for Gaza, that's fine for Palestine. You can give all your money. I don't care. Uh, my problem is this, that you're giving money, but you're not taking in one single individual. Why is Mohammed Saleh giving money to Gaza? You know, when you ask why, then people start saying, you're racist, you're communal. No, Mohammed Saleh is a Muslim. He is giving money to the people of Palestine through the Egyptian Red Crescent because they are Muslims. It's about religion. It's not about humanity, humanity. All this humanity nonsense that people talk about is utter bilge. This is no con there is no concept of humanity, by the way. This is religion, and I will tell you why. I met a lot of people. In fact, I was speaking to uh, this this guy in is a Pakistani guy in UK, and he says I want to I'm sending money and I want to support the Palestinians, and I and I said that uh, sure do it, you know, do it, and I said why are you doing it? Is it because you feel that? Uh, you know, they're also Muslims and you're a Muslim, therefore you should support them. He said, no, 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 it's not about that. It's, you see, it's, it's affinity towards anybody who's been wronged and I believe their land has been taken away. You know, their rights have been trampled upon by the Israelis and Israel is a bad country and it's an occupation force. And I said, why do you say occupation, occupation? Because they've taken away land of the Palestinians. That is what this gentleman, Pakistani Muslim gentleman in UK told me that, you know, they've taken away their land. And therefore, I'm coming in front and I'm, I'm going to be part of this rally. He's very passionate and, you know, I'm going to Tel Aviv and, you know, have a word with the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu myself. How dare you and all that. So he was in that mode. And I asked him that, uh, you know, it's because of religion, right, that you're supporting. He said, no, 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 it's not because of religion. It's because they've been wronged and Israelis are occupiers. They've occupied their land in the sense that Israel is occupied a Palestinian lands. That is what he was saying. Then I turned around the conversation, I said, but last year, Russia took over Ukrainian land. Did you send money to Ukraine? Did you protest on the streets? Did you get your community out and say, we want to protest Russian action in Ukraine? He said, no, 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 Major, that's totally different, yeah. Major, that's very different. I said, how is it different? A bigger power takes away land from a smaller country. You say nothing. It doesn't matter to you. You don't give money to Ukraine and actually, as far as I'm concerned, Major Gauravaria, I don't support Ukraine. I think Zelensky is a clown. But I was just giving an example to figure out because Russia has occupied uh, Ukrainian territory. And I said, did you stand up for the Ukrainians? He said, no. But it's another matter. I said, how is it another matter? After some time, he understood and he said that, yeah. So this is why the support is happening. Whether it is that model Jiji Hadid, right? Whether it's uh, Mia Khalifa, that adult uh, star, whether it's Mohammed Saleh, all of them were publicly supporting. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. Please don't misunderstand, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not saying this is wrong. All I'm saying is that they should be blunt about it. This is not about Israeli aggression. This is about Islamic forces on one side and Jewish forces on the other side. This is what it is. I want to know how much money Mohammed Saleh gave to the Ukrainians. Okay? I'd like to understand. In the late 80s and early 90s, there was this huge operation in Sri Lanka where Tamils were killed in the thousands. Innocent Tamils were killed. Innocent Tamils. How, how, many, how many people from across the world said that, you know, we are giving money to these Tamils because they needed it and they were actually, Tamils were actually very badly mistreated. Sure, LTT was a terror organization. I say that. Yes, LTT was a terror organization. But a vast majority of Sri Lankan Tamils had nothing to do with LTT. 
they were common people, they were poor people and they were killed. Did any of them stand for those Tamils? No, nobody stood for the Tamils. There are flashpoints all over the world. They don't stand for anybody. That's why I'm saying, I'm not saying it's wrong. If, if, if there is a Hindu in Pakistan, I will go out of my way to help because I have that affinity. I have that affinity and I'm saying it. I'm saying it bluntly. If there is a Hindu in Pakistan and if he needs my help, I will help him to whatever extent I can help him. And I'm being blunt about it. Similarly, I expect all these people, I'm a very small person, I'm not very well known, but Mohammed Saleh is a superstar. He's a super duper star. He's one of the top footballers in the world. If I can say it as an absolute nobody that I'm supporting Pakistani Hindus because they're Hindus and I'm a proud Hindu and I will continue to support them, whatever little I can do, he should also say. He should say, Mohammed Saleh should say that I'm supporting because we share a common religion. That's it. And that is the only logic in this case. It's not wrong. It's absolutely not wrong. If Mia Khalifa supports, you know, whatever she said is wrong, but her intent to support, you know, she said that, you know, put the camera like this and I will tell the, she's a brainless person. I don't want to talk about her. And Gigi Hadid, you know, whatever she said, it's Gigi Hadid's right to support whomsoever she wants to support. Yeah? And if she wants to support them because they are Muslims, God bless her, that's her right. And I cannot fault her for that. But to say that, no, there is some other motive and there is a higher motive and it's about humanity. It's not about humanity. It's about religion. It's as simple as that. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we come to the end of this video. Now for question and answers. The first question is from Rohit Prasad. Uh, he said, well said, Major. Thank you. I, I don't know why he said well said, Major, for what, but anyway. One thing I can't put my finger on is what is going on with Russia's stance in the conflict. They look, look a bit bullish towards Israel, despite Israel having had good ties with Russia, especially with Putin. Would you would like your views on this, Major? Uh, bullish has a different connotation, actually. Bullish is more positive. Bearish is, so bulls and bears, as they say uh, in the stock market. But see, Russia is also influenced by China. You have to understand that. Behind this entire game somewhere, very, very quietly, is China playing its chess moves. And these problems, you know, these conflicts in the world will flare up. Which is why I'm, I'm, Russia, you saw Russia is very close to China, has become closer and closer still because the West was stupid enough because of the Ukraine war, they isolated Russia. Russia shook hands, you know, Putin shook hands with Xi Jinping. They were already close. This conflict made them closer. The West can sometimes be stupid. They create enemies out of thin air. That's all we have for you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be back again tomorrow with a new fresh video. If you like this video, press the like button, subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to press the bell icon. Jai Hind, Vande Mataram, Bharat Mata Ki Jai.